Hi everybody and welcome to the Tool Application Seminar. Um, throughout this presentation, I'm going to give you an idea um, of how to actually go and look at a application, a process, and things along those lines um, to really give you a better understanding outside of the tool, the cable, and the controller. So the whole package from basically floor to ceiling on what you're going to want to be looking at or looking for. So this is the agenda. So basically we're going to review the station level considerations, then the process. Once we go through those two, we're going to look at ergonomics and safety, and then selecting the proper content. So obviously depending on what type of station or process, there might be content that is specifically for one or the other. Then Smart Connected is talking more about the actual um, IT aspect of it. So if you have MES or things along those lines. And then we have a little bit of an example at the end of walk the line and how you would actually utilize some of the things that Atlas Copco has prepared that's going to kind of walk you through this entire process. So first we're going to start with some terminology. So basically here we're going to go through some of the things that for anybody that's new to either an organization or Atlas Copco, you're going to be able to look at some of these terms and what they mean. So jumping right into the station level consideration. So basically in this section we're going to look at the assembly type and then some of the things that we need to be thinking about if there's an assembly type that you're specifically responsible for to give them an idea of what type of system or application we can provide to them. So the first one would be moving lines. So Obviously there's a lot of different types of moving lines, so we can have overhead chain, floor chain or pallet, an AGV, a conveyor, so these are some of the continuous moving um, applications that you might see out there in the environment. And some of the questions that we want to really consider is, what type of footprint do they have, large or small? Um, does there need to be any type of bolt level air proofing? So obviously when we start talking about moving lines, bolt level air proofing starts to become a little bit of a um, issue, but we do have things that are available for those types of applications as well. Is a tool and the process tethered, tethering required? So in this case, you know, there's going to be some times where you're going to want to make sure that the tool stays in the right location or the operator stays in the correct location. So we can kind of review some of those things along those lines. And then cable management. So basically, if you have a cable tool, where is the cable going? So obviously, if the cable is on the floor, that brings up, you know, obviously some issues as far as ergonomics or a trip hazard. So we want to make sure that we understand exactly where that cabling is going and how it is being uh, managed. Is there torque reaction required due to high torque? So obviously on a moving line, generally, um, you're going to have lower torques, especially if you're talking about final assembly. But sometimes in powertrain or other assembly types, you're going to have high torque. So we have to start thinking about any type of torque reaction, so any type of, of torque tube or torque arm, things along those lines. Orientation is one of those things that we have to be conscious of as well when we start talking about adding any type of torque reaction into the into the station because you sometimes don't want those to sit parallel with the uh, line you're going to want them to be perpendicular and then other things we want to talk about is reject management so obviously with moving lines sometimes if the part fails out it will be on that same line but then it'll get to a point where it'll split off and go to maybe a repair bay or do they want them to complete the process and then just move down the line and then once it's completed it'll go offline from there so these are some of the things that we want to think about for moving lines. So the next one is a manual stop station. So again, there's different ways that those parts can be um, presented in the station. So again, AGV, a conveyor, a moving cart, a semi-automatic station. So you can kind of see here in some of the images some of those things that we have um, actually presenting the part in the station. And again, things to consider. So. We start talking about the space in between the stations and the controllers. So obviously when we start talking about stop stations, it's generally larger components that you're working on or um, looking at. So we want to start thinking about how, you know, how far is it spread out and what can we provide um, from an application standpoint to help in that particular station. Is there a crane overhead? there's going to be some type of crane or overhead structure. So we have to be conscious of that when we start talking about providing 
any type of arms or torque tubes because either we would have to go to them and say this is something that is needed or if there's something overhead maybe we have to come up with a better solution for that type of application. What is the wireless connectivity in the plant? So obviously when you start talking about stations being wider apart, those access points to connectivity for the tooling, controllers, any type of add-on accessories, you know, you might be worried about signal issues as far as the connectivity. So that's something we want to be really conscious of when we start looking at the station layouts. Are there any larger objects to work around? So if you want to, you know, possibly put some type of torque reaction or arm in place, do you have the ability to actually move it out of the way so that part can continue down the line? And then again, regardless of it being manual stop station or automatic line, we want to talk about that reject management again. So how is the part being presented while being put together? So from an automatic stop station, so obviously this is a same kind of idea, but a little bit different in the sense that the component is going to come into the station and you're, it's going to stop in that station. So you might have a robotic cell, an automated machine mounting. So we want to talk about that from a component of how that is actually being presented, how the process is being driven, and we want to think about controllers and spindles. So in this case, a lot of these types of, of setups, you're going to not necessarily have just one spindle, you're going to have multiple spindles. So we have to think about how is the bolt being presented. So is it some type of hand started or bolt feeder, things along those lines. Where are the cables going? So obviously if you have a robotic cell or an automated machine, you're going to have all that cabling coming out of those spindles. How is that being managed? Is it going to some type of overhead gantry? How many cables are there? Because obviously if it's a station that is already existing, we might have a solution that can be provided where you're limiting the amount of cabling that is needed by moving from one system to a different system. So we want to think about not necessarily just new lines or new stations, but maybe existing stations that we can help uh, provide a different type of solution for. What type of guarding or safety function is there in the station? So obviously with robotics, generally there's a lot of guarding around those cells so you can't get in close to those robots. But we also want to think about in the future when we have a lot of these cobots, how do you actually safely work around those and what can be provided in that case? When we start talking about multiple spindles in these types of stations as well, we want to think about how are they going to be calibrated or maintained? So we want to address when we're actually providing a solution or taking a look at that station, we want to make sure that we're providing the right equipment, but also making it easy for those to be maintained and calibrated in the future, because obviously that is something that we would require and recommend. And then how does the operator communicate with the controller? So is there some type of computer offline or out of the cell? Is it all web-based? So are they communicating it to it through some type of Wi-Fi or Bluetooth signal? And again, we go back to that reject management. How is that being addressed? So the next one is subassembly stations. So this is something that you're going to have maybe two different ways of looking at or, or accomplishing it. So you have assembly workstations, so the whole part is being completed in that station. Or maybe it's an offline workstation that's feeding the main line. So those are two of the main things that we kind of look at that we have to be um, considering. So um, how does the operator actually fit in the station? So you can see in this image here, we have a scissor lift that's actually presenting the part higher so they're not bending over to work on that component. So we want to think about from an ergonomic standpoint, is it safe for the operator to actually be in that station and how they're actually going to work or function using those components? Is the tooling being supported for weight or reaction? So obviously with some of these smaller cells, if you present some type of torque reaction or smaller arm, does it actually fit? Is it natural for them to want to bring it over and move it around? We want to make sure that there's not any type of pull, push-pull forces that exceed what an operator would feel comfortable doing. Obviously, if it's a main feed line, we start talking about PLC and internal MESs. So once they've completed that component, what's actually feeding it to the main line? So is it something that's internal or is it a process where the operator is actually manually moving it? So we want to be thinking about all of that when we start providing equipment that might be in the way that, that would have to be pushed out of the way for them to move anything around. And then floor space. 
So obviously in this type of image you see here, there might not be a whole lot of floor space for us to add some type of torque reaction or something along those lines. But there is, there does seem to be a lot of overhead area, so maybe it's something that we can provide some type of overhead um, reaction or structure for them. And then the last one, so I kept talking about repair, but now we're actually looking and thinking about the repair line itself. So inline repair, end of line repair, or offline repair. So obviously, as those components come into the station, again, some of the things we need to think about is what's instructing the operator? Is there some type of MES system or feedback system that's actually telling them what bolt failed, the process in which it failed, and then actually how to actually put it back together? So. One thing that we really want to emphasize and think about is we have all these great strategies and tooling that are online, but then when it goes to repair, sometimes we don't always put that same emphasis on making sure that the component is put back together exactly the same way it was initially supposed to from the beginning. And then what tooling is being used? So obviously there's a lot of stations where you might be able to utilize one or two tools that cover the wide range of the stations that we're putting it together in the first place. So we don't want to have a repair station that has multiple tools, 10, you know, 15 tools for them to complete a process from a repair standpoint. So can we utilize maybe one or two tools and then a bunch of different sockets that would utilize putting that component together and repairing it in that station. So now moving away from the actual stations themselves, we want to start thinking about the process. And what we want to consider as far as a process standpoint. So some of the things to consider here is how is the bolt started? So is it hand started or bolt started? So obviously going back to thinking about a moving line or an automated line, in a moving line you might have more hand started bolts but in a uh, stop station or a robotic station you're going to have something that's probably presenting those screws or those bolts to that actual tool. Then we want to start thinking about, is it a single spindle operation or a multi-spindle operation? And again, this isn't just necessarily thinking of a brand new line, but in an existing line, is it something that's been done with stitching with one tool that maybe in the future could be utilized by adding multiple tools, and now you can make sure that you have the quality there, everything's running together, and you have that complete traceability. And the best part of it is you're able to increase the tack time now. So instead of an operator doing a process by hand multiple times, the system's going to do it with one trigger pull and you can move on from there. So sometimes we can actually influence the actual process and make it quicker for the corporation or the operator. How is the process controlled? Operator, station, MES, PLC. So obviously I talked about in those different types of stations, you might have a process where an operator moves the component around or maybe the line moves it around and then there's also going to be those situations where as soon as that last green light goes off for that tool the system is automatically going to recognize that the EGV or the part can actually move down the line from there. So we want to think about all the processes that come into controlling the actual functionality of that station and how that works. How does the tool fit in the actual station? So is it vertical, is it horizontal, is it cabled or battery? So obviously all of these come into play with something that we would look at and spec out from an Atlas Coptico standpoint, but also from a customer standpoint. How are you actually going to look at that station and how are you going to utilize it? And obviously there's a lot of cases from a customer standpoint where engineering might actually specify that this is the way it has to be put together, but now you actually have to go out and figure out how to actually accomplish that. And that obviously comes into consideration when you start looking at tooling, how it's actually mounted, and how the operator will fit in the station and how the process will be completed. Other things to consider is the actual floor and how everything comes together. So obviously you can see in this image on the right, there's multiple things moving on in there. You have a lot of different cabling hanging down, you have some torque reaction hanging down, you have larger components that are on the floor that everybody is working around or working on. So we have to think about pre-existing architecture. So if you're walking the line, you know, there's a chance that maybe from an Atlas Copco standpoint, we can provide a better solution, minimizing some of the things that are required in that space. So you start talking about floor mounted assists, rail mounted assists, different types of torque, torque tubes or overhead gantries. And then the biggest thing that I think sometimes we have a tendency from either a customer standpoint or Atlas Copco standpoint is we start thinking about power and network drops. So 
I started talking about some of those larger stations and a stop station and sometimes even in a automated line, how many power drops do you need for all of the controllers or tooling? And not only that, but you know, do you have any type of computer system that's actually instructing the operator on what is being accomplished in that station? So we have to think about all of that when we start talking about the pre-existing or future architecture of that particular station. Where are the components sourced from? So obviously we have pick to light bins, feeder lines, automated guided vehicles, so AGVs. So obviously we want to talk about, you know, are the components coming to the station? Does the operator have to move around a lot? Is there something that can be utilized or positioned in a better way? When you're talking about the tooling being closer to where the operator is, so they don't have to walk as far for multiple tools or sockets. But then also, we don't want to interfere with where the actual parts are being provided. So we don't want them to have to walk to get a tool, walk back and pick a part, and then walk back to the part. So we really want to make sure that we're utilizing the space in the best way. So we've accomplished going through the different types of station types, the processes that we want to think about, and now we want to emphasize ergonomics and safety. And I know moving into um, 2019, 2020 period of time, Ergonomics and safety is becoming a key factor in all factories across the world. And this is something that Atlas Copco puts a lot of emphasis in as well when it comes to our tooling and the way that our torque tubes are arms. So just talking about push-pull forces and things along those lines. So we want to make sure that we're really paying attention to this moving forward. So this is a really cool image here on the right. This gives you an idea of the actual reaction when the tool is running down, the reaction is being pushed away, but your arm is pulling towards you and other ways, depending on how the tool is actually set up. So this gives you an idea of how that actually is forces are felt to the operator. So when you start talking about max torque reaction for the style of the tool, five newt meters is pretty much standard when you're talking about an inline tool, 12 newt meters for a pistol grip tool. And obviously that varies based on customer's requirements. Um, there are tools out there in the market that allow you to go up higher as far as newt meters or torque reaction without using any type of, uh, of torque tubes or arms or anything along those lines. We talk about um, 25 for the supporting handle and then 50 newt meters for a right angle tool. So obviously based on that reaction when you have two hands on that tool, your body can handle up higher um, as far as the torque reaction. Now there are different types of strategies within our tools at Atlas Copco, but I'm assuming in other corporations tools as well, that allow you to go higher based on some of the strategies that are built into the tools. Torque reaction can cause injury and process efficiency. So we start talking about possibilities that it can include from an injury is over the head, so the operator is reaching higher to actually do a manual process or have to grab at a torque tube or an arm or a tool. Um, One-handed operation, so depending on how much torque is in it or how they're actually physically holding the tool, sometimes one-handed operations can hurt you long-term. The vibration or torque actually felt in the hand, the wrist, and the forearm. Over time, that can actually break down the body's process and the way that it actually functions and feels from your nerve endings. And then holding the tool incorrectly. The one thing I want to point out in that top right corner is we have an image that I think sometimes we don't generally always look at, and that is you can have a process and you can think about an operator that's on maybe line one, and what happens if that operator has to leave for the day and is out, and then you have a, a replacement operator that's going to come into that exact same cell. Maybe they're different heights. Maybe it's a male versus a female and how they can actually hold certain tooling. So we want to make sure that we're actually providing and looking at the correct equipment that's going to be able to be moved up or down, left or right, based on the operators that are actually coming into that station or that cell that are going to have to put that process or that component together. So we really want to be thinking about all those things when we start talking about tooling from a standpoint of what is the best tool for that particular station. Low reaction strategies. So this is something that utilizes multiple different variations within the tool and the controller that allows the tool to actually control how much force and reaction is felt by the operator. So as the tool wants to pull away from you or pull towards you, 
the system is actually going to recognize that from a torque standpoint. So we read the angle of the tool. So there's gyroscopes that are built in tools and that allows for us to actually measure based on that angle whether or not the tool should run or not run. So these are all things that we can kind of talk about as far as low reaction strategies that Atlas Copco can provide. The best thing about this is now we're starting to talk about based on these new strategies and these new tools that have low reaction, we're actually able to remove some of the arms or torque tubes that would have been required in the past. And now you have the space savings, you have the hardware savings, and now you're able to do that operation with just one simple tool rather than all of that ad additional cost or equipment that would have been required in the past. From a tool safety standpoint, so we start talking about safety sockets. So this is something that I think a lot of our customers require and a lot of operators are forced to wear gloves during a process. But obviously when you have tooling that is spinning at the end, that can cause an issue for safety where if a piece of that fabric gets caught, it's going to spin and it potentially could hurt the operator or their hands. So we look at safety sleeves, which basically allows for you to hold that yellow sleeve and then the socket inside of that is going to turn, eliminating any chance of a hand getting pinched or, or torn or anything along those lines. The other thing that we have is different types of tooling. So in this image in the middle on the bottom, this is a tool that requires two triggers. So your, your hand has to be on the top trigger and the bottom trigger for the process to actually start. And that eliminates any type of pinch points or an operator's hands being in the wrong location while that process is being completed. I already spoke about the angle control, so this allows for you to know if you're inside that window or outside the window on whether or not the tool should run. You know, I talked about from a safety standpoint, it's been seen in the past where a tool, if there's a large torque being put in, if an operator lets go, that tool is going to spin. So obviously there's a chance for anybody's hands to get pinched or, or stuck in between a component and that tool obviously causing injury. And then in the bottom right hand corner, this is something that is being able to be provided and utilized now. So if you have some type of torque tube um, that is running parallel with the actual line, if you're running high torque, sometimes what will happen, especially on single trolleys like you see here in this image, they'll have a tendency to kick out when you've reached that final torque because if that torque is going to run up the tube and then want to make that top kick out. So it's something that can be provided to those types of assemblies where it's actually a break. So when you pull the trigger, it's actually going to lock in place and it's not going to allow that to actually shoot out. So now again, eliminating any chance of that tool hitting the operator or hitting a different operator down the line if it kicks out. So now we move into selecting proper content. So we've established the assembly type process and the ergonomics that we want to think about in those stations. <clears throat> there are four main technologies that we talk about with tightenings. So the first one is impact. So this is something that has existed for a very long time. So basically you're going to have some type of pneumatic tool and an anvil that's going to constantly be hitting, giving you that impact, um, allowing you to do higher torques with somewhat less reaction. And then we have hydraulic impacts. So obviously here you have oil in there that's obviously helping with the anvil hit and it pulses per revolution. Then we have electric pulsing. So this is something that is fairly new. So we're taking that idea of what we've learned from the pact with impact and oil pulsing and moving it into electronic pulsing. So DC is driving that anvil to hit but we're able to accomplish higher torques with less reaction based in that tool by pulsing the motor and the gears back and forth. And then the last is just a DC driven tool. So this is just a gear pack and a motor in there that's driving the end of that tool um, to the torque that's required based by the gears. And this gives you an idea of the images um, of those different components. So from left to right, you're kind of looking at somewhat the generation of tooling as we've advanced as well. So we've moved away from air and, and pneumatics and oil into DC and battery driven tooling. 
So this just gives you an idea for anybody that's not familiar with actually what is a pneumatic tool or as DC driven tool that I'll show on the next slide. But this just gives you an idea of an overview of, of some of those things, what it is and what actually makes up a pneumatic tool and some of the things that we'll have to think about with different types of hoses, air fittings or couplers, how those are actually going to fit into the station. So these are some of the things that you're going to want to think about. And again, same with this, so electric tools. So we talk about what it is and then how you're actually selecting the tool, so different types of right angle, pistol, and line. And then again, we want to think about cable and cable management. And then if it's not a cable tool and it's a battery, we want to think about, okay, so where are the extra batteries kept? We want to think about the chargers. We want to think about during the process and how it's actually being completed, whether or not that battery is actually going to make it through the entire day or process. So sometimes if you have a harder joint, you might run through that battery life a little faster. So all those things need to be taken into consideration, and we want to make sure that those batteries and the chargers are kept closer to the station if that is the type of tooling that is selected. All right, from an accessory standpoint, these are some of the accessories that can be added to the tooling based on maybe different types of automated stations or stop stations. And this is really how we're going to accomplish some of those things within that station. So EHMI, so this gives you the ability to add this to tooling. This gives you the option of seeing the batch count, any types of programs you're able to select between the two. Um, as we move forward, there's a lot more batteries tools in the in the field and in the market. So obviously you're gonna to wanna to be able to have options, because you're not always gonna be able to see that controller, you're gonna have multiple tools running on that controller, you can't always run back and see it. From a barcode standard point, standpoint, you're gonna be able to look at a barcode scanner and pick what part is in the station, so it's automatically gonna select um, the batch or the program that it should be running, but it's also gonna track the actual part that's in the station and whether or not all of those bolts were completed in the process. So then if anything happens down the road, obviously from a safety standpoint, you're gonna know all those bolts were correctly tightened and fastened in the correct way. Socket tray, so obviously we're gonna have multiple tools in the station. This gives you the ability to pick different sockets. The great thing about this is the minute you pick that socket, each socket can have its own PSAT or process base to it. So you could do different processes within the station by not having to select different tools. You're just going to select a different socket. Stack lights is something that you can add to a station uh, just to give you a, a good rundown, bad rundown, and if the process is ready to start. But you can also select by the keystroke what tightening process that you should be running. So this gives you some added functionality to that type of stack light. In the bottom and the middle, you're gonna have bolt level guidance. So this is something that's gonna be more in your safety critical type of components or joints. And this is gonna force an operator to follow a certain pattern. Um, regardless of how many bolts you have, it's gonna force them to follow that. So you know for a fact that all of them have been, have been tightened correctly and in the processor way that you've designed by engineering standards. And then the last thing is different type of tethering options. So again, as we move towards battery tools, how do we make sure that that tool stays in the station that it's, it should? So you add a tag to the tool, and now you can actually set a min and a max distance in which you can work from that base station, now making sure that that tool stays in that correct location. From a tool suspension standpoint, this gives you an idea. So on the left, you can see different type of assembly types like we talked about um, initially in this presentation and this gives you a different idea of which one of these will work in those stations obviously not every single one of these works for the for the same location so this gives you an idea of which ones to be utilized in what type of process when it comes to those actual um, different types of torque tubes or arms how are the tools actually mounted are they straight or inline are they a right angle do they need to rotate or is it a pistol so these are great things that we can add on to our torque arms and torque tubes that are standard products here at Atlas Copco. And then we're actually going to give you the instructions on how to actually mount these in the correct way. And this is something that I've seen in the past that isn't utilized in the correct way, which is basically sometimes you'll put a tool holder around the transducer, which will eventually give you bad readings. 
It's meant to be located across the gear pack, so it's you know there's an exact location in which it should be um, located on the tool. So this gives you an idea of where exactly you need to mount it. And then cable management. So I've talked about that kind of throughout this entire presentation on how that's actually managed. So that's really your biggest shortfall is cabling. If a cable gets pinched, if a cable gets ripped, something along those lines, you might not know it, but if you're having interference with your tool or your controller and you're not getting proper readouts, there is a chance that something's happened with the cable. So this is really your biggest shortfall within that process. So we have different types of, of ways of, of presenting that. So we have a document that says how each cable should be bent, what kind of arc should be um, presented within those cable shoes, J-hooks, things along those lines um, in the process. The biggest thing that I can possibly emphasize about is do not mount cables with zip ties. Eventually those will eat away at that cabling and then you're going to be stuck with a cable that's going to be giving you false readings for that tool because of the system um, is going to be hard to read. But the biggest thing is now the time consuming of actually going into those gantries of cable trays and actually finding where that cable is ripped or how it's broken. So we start to move towards Smart Connected. So obviously in this process, we're going to talk about actually the processes of how they're being managed. So we have MES systems, soft PLCs. So these are the ones that are going to actually control the part and how it's moving within the, the factory or the station. How is the data being collected? So is it still being paper collection? So you actually have somebody writing down information and then going to a computer and typing that in? Or do you have internal collection services like a lot of our customers do, they automatically collect all their information, or we have external collection services here at Atlas Copco that we can present where all of our tooling and all of our equipment will actually report out to our systems and now you can utilize that in a new way. So how is that being used? So obviously you can actually report it out to Excel and manipulate it that way, or within our external collection services you can actually pick how you want to see that data in these widgets and it's automatically going to show you the graphs and the reports um, automatically and then it's actually going to give you um, emails or text message alerts if something's happening within that station. So this is basically an overview and giving you a good idea of this not only the applications and the process but really the complete idea um, of what we want to roll out here in the future. So we want to make sure that we're not just providing tooling and equipment, we want to make sure that we're providing complete solutions to the customers and making sure that the operators really enjoy what they're doing and how they're being utilized within those stations. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us at this email address and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.